In the last episode, the Shogunate gave clearance to the Shimazu clan to launch an invasion of the Ryukyu Kingdom, a string of islands that sat between the shores of Kyushu and Taiwan. In action to not only reign in the islands, but also to secure renewed trade between Japan and China in the wake of the Imjin War, as well as, perhaps, safeguarding against the spread of Christianity throughout the Pacific. But now, things in Japan are set to unravel, as strain between Tokugawa Ieyasu and Toyotomi Hideyori will mount, leading to a decay in this age of peace. By 1611, it had been eight years since the birth of Tokugawa Ieyasu's Edo Shogunate, the powerful military government that ruled with his name. And although he had since retired from the actual office of Shogun itself, he still maintained a commanding grip over the nation. One by one, his worries must have faded away as peace continued to reign supreme over the land. Ieyasu had survived what had been the most violent century in Japanese history. But not only had he made his way through it, but he had also placed himself in a prime position to establish the mightiest of all regimes, succeeding where his predecessors had failed, and handing things off to his son and heir Hidetada, who would continue to govern with stability and security for years to come. As stated before, though, if any worry did still linger in his mind, it likely had to do with the heir to the Toyotomi name, a young man by the name of Toyotomi Hideyori, who Ieyasu had confined in Osaka. For years, there had been no tension, no cause for concern. Ieyasu had done much to safeguard against any threat that may arise from leaving the son of Toyotomi Hideyoshi alive and well, and in a position of strength at one of the most impressive castles in the entire country. He had married his granddaughter, the child of the now Shogun Hidetada, to Hideyori, forming a familial bond between the houses of Tokugawa and Toyotomi. But Ieyasu had also done much to set up powerful bastions to curb any Toyotomi influence that may seep out from Osaka. Although Edo had essentially become the new governing head of the country, where the shogunate imposed their rule upon all the land, Ieyasu had of course kept up his powerful grip on Fushimi Castle outside Kyoto, and built up the prominent Nijo Castle within Kyoto itself as a means to firmly control the politics of the imperial city. If there was any continued Toyotomi sympathy, it would not be able to get far without being swiftly challenged by the Tokugawa. Of course, Hideyori's mother, the prominent Yorodono, had her grievances with this chain of events. Not only had her son been robbed of the future he had once been destined for, but now he was ever confined and restricted. No doubt the anger and hatred she felt towards the Tokugawa would have been vocalized and made to affect the growth and development of the young Hideyori. He soon enough would have become aware of the future that Ieyasu had stolen from his family, the vows that Ieyasu had forsaken from his father Hideyoshi. After the death of Maeda Toshiie and of course with Ieyasu's victory at Sekigahara, throughout Hideyori's childhood, he would come to be guardianed by a figure named Katagiri Katsumoto. Katsumoto was a well-renowned samurai who had been one of the famous Seven Spears of Shizugatake along with the likes of Kato Kiyomasa. He had been a Toyotomi loyalist throughout his life, yet now with Ieyasu in charge, he did his best to walk a fine line between service to the Toyotomi heir and loyalty to the new Tokugawa regime. It is here a story emerges that for one reason or another, perhaps to keep Hideyori safe or rather the Tokugawa satisfied, Katsumoto began talking of Hideyori in a way that painted him in an effeminate manner, in a way that perhaps made him seem like no real leader who would ever rise up to challenge the Tokugawa Bakufu. If this is true, it would have likely gone far to calm Ieyasu's worried mind. 
Yet, if Ieyasu did ever fully believe this myth, it would all come crashing down in 1611, when he and Hideyori were set to meet face to face in Kyoto. This was the first time these two had met in a long while, and it was for sure an interesting meeting at that. It was a rare yet perfect time when both Ieyasu and Hideyori were both in the same place at the same time. It was all during the festivities leading up to the coronation of the new emperor, Go Mizuno, an occasion that called for the presence of the retired shogun Ieyasu, and a seldom yet important opportunity for Hideyori to briefly leave Osaka. The two would meet at Nijo Castle, where Ieyasu was staying, but also an obvious spot for a gathering of such importance. This appears, at least from what I have seen, to be the first time they actually met when Hideyori was now an adult. All prior encounters between the two of them had occurred while Hideyori was still just a child, and certainly there was plenty of potential for tension to arise between the two of them. However, to mediate this meeting and ensure cooler heads was none other than Kato Kiyomasa. If we remember back, Kiyomasa, whose domain was in Higo province on Kyushu, had supported the Tokugawa during the Sekigahara conflict despite the fact that he had been a staunch Toyotomi loyalist. He was always someone who had been very close to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, as they had both actually been distant relatives. Because of this, Hideyoshi had seen to Kiyomasa's military upbringing. Under Hideyoshi, he had become one of the most prominent samurai leaders in all of Japan, leading armies in many of Hideyoshi's campaigns both in Japan and later in Korea. Yet, in the build-up to the Battle of Sekigahara, he surprisingly chose to side against the side of the Toyotomi loyalists, largely because it appears he had a strong hatred for Ishida Mitsunari, who was coming to lead the pro-Toyotomi faction. In the end, he likely just trusted Ieyasu far more than he did with Mitsunari, whom he suspected might simply come to influence and dominate the power the young Hideyori held. In the aftermath, it is hard to truly know how Kiyomasa came to view Ieyasu, who obviously did go on to publicly usurp power from Hideyori. Rumors and legends suggest that Kiyomasa likely did hold at least an ounce of animosity toward Ieyasu, as there is even a story that Kiyomasa may have secretly carried a dagger into this meeting between Ieyasu and Hideyori in 1611, just in case Ieyasu tried to do anything rash against the Toyotomi heir. And it does seem very likely that Ieyasu was, too, well aware of Kiyomasa's Toyotomi sympathies. But it doesn't appear to be clear to what level Kiyomasa had to actually mediate the meeting between Ieyasu and Hideyori. Yet, one thing was very obvious. What Ieyasu saw in Hideyori alarmed him greatly. The young man who sat before him was not the effeminate and weak-willed child he may have been led to believe Hideyori was. Instead, said a competent leader who was well aware of himself and his position. Ieyasu is said to have complimented Hideyori for the way he carried himself, as he genuinely appeared as a true ruler. A terrifying notion. Not only did Hideyori appear capable of one day challenging the Tokugawa, but he also had the potential of prominent figures like Kiyomasa who may side with him. And if someone as famous and respected as Kiyomasa were to flip, who knows who else might join him? The Tokugawa had no shortage of enemies and rivals. Quickly, things could all come crashing down for Ieyasu. Or even more worrying, with Ieyasu well into old age, being in his late 60s at the time of this meeting, if he were to die without the strong figurehead he was in charge, everything he had established could be destroyed. After the meeting had ended and they went their separate ways, Ieyasu's mind must have now been entirely focused on the situation with Hideyori. And there is an interesting legend that may show just how quickly he responded. While Kato Kiyomasa was en route back home to Kyushu, he took ill and would later die once reaching his stronghold of Kumamoto in August of that year. He was just around the age of 50 and his death very much appears to have been somewhat sudden. This has led to the rise of a popular story that Ieyasu may have had Kiyomasa poisoned. A preemptive measure to ensure a legendary figure such as him would not live to take the side of Hideyori should conflict arise between the Tokugawa and Toyotomi in the years to come. 
Whether or not this is true is widely debated. However, Ieyasu is also deep into other schemes to curb Hideyori's power. One aspect that Ieyasu had been working on for some time was to reduce the massive Toyotomi gold reserves that were held in Osaka. Ieyasu had hoped that the construction of the Great Buddha of Kyoto, a pet project brought about by Hideyoshi years earlier but had seen many difficulties, would be a large money pit with which Hideyori's wealth may fall into. Yet by 1612, construction of the Great Buddha of Kyoto had finished and had only put a minor dent in his gold reserves. And additionally, with Hideyori still having access to the ports of Osaka and Sakai, trade revenue allowed for his wealth to continually be replenished. It was clear for Ieyasu that he would not be able to cripple Hideyori economically. And it was equally clear that other measures he had taken against Hideyori were too inadequate in the long run. It did not matter if he had been confined to Osaka, or that he had been married into the Tokugawa. Trying to burn a hole into his wealth didn't matter, and the numerous hubs of Tokugawa influence around Osaka did not make Ieyasu feel any safer against a potential uprising. Deep down, Ieyasu probably knew that there was only one answer. He had to destroy the Toyotomi once and for all. Only then could he feel that the land was firmly at peace and under his family's full control. However, he still needed some form of justification before attempting any form of military action against Hideyori. For a while after their meeting, they continued to exchange an array of gifts. Originally started by Ieyasu as a means to perhaps ease any lingering tension and display goodwill, to his surprise, Hideyori returned the favor and sent gifts back to him. This then prompted Ieyasu to send more, to which Hideyori continually sent more back to him. Gifts of horses, swords, and coinage were endlessly shifted back and forth, with Ieyasu wishing to have the last word and to have it be meant as a statement of a lord to his inferior, while Hideyori was all too willing to engage in playful pleasantries. This must have infuriated Ieyasu to no end. Yet while political gifts were being shot endlessly across the country, we can also see the buildup of another commodity, gunpowder. By 1614, English merchants had recorded that sales of gunpowder were in high demand in Edo, a fascinating detail being that it appeared the opposite was true for Hideyori in Osaka, as he was not stocking up nearly as much. It just goes to illustrate that it appears Hideyori, at least by this point in time, was not at all anticipating a war with the Tokugawa. However, he would unknowingly still cause one. With the completion of the Great Buddha in Kyoto, one element that was left was to be the casting of a great bronze bell to dedicate its temple. The task was begun in May of 1614, and when finished, would shake the very foundations of the land. Whether by design or by pure coincidence, the inscriptions on the bell were highly controversial, at least from a certain point of view. One inscription, which read, May the state be peaceful and prosperous, was marred by symbols Ka and Ko, which could also be interpreted to be read as Ieyasu's name. Thus, Ieyasu perceived it to be mocking him. Additionally, another damning inscription on the bell read, On the east it welcomes the bright moon. On the west bids farewell to the setting sun. Ieyasu, too, perceived this as symbolism for his position in the east and the Toyotomi position in the west, another disastrous slight. All in all, this was a complete fiasco, and although many have said that Ieyasu's claims about the bell were petty or flimsy, it should also be considered that these inscriptions were questionable at best. Someone must have known that they may be misinterpreted as a challenge to the Tokugawa, it is hard to assume that there was not at least an ounce of purpose behind this, being directed somewhat at the Tokugawa and the position they had left the Toyotomi in. Quickly, following the unveiling of the bell and the falling out between Ieyasu and Hideyori, there was at least one attempt to settle things diplomatically before they got out of hand. As Katagiri Katsumoto was set to mediate the dispute between the two houses, however, Hideyori's mother Yorodono was fast to suspect Katsumoto of potentially leaking information to the Tokugawa, and thus he was forced to flee Osaka. Everything was now falling apart, and hostilities seemed inevitable. 
swiftly. Records indicate gunpowder sales skyrocketing in Osaka as a military buildup commenced. Hideyori and his mother knew war was on the horizon, and thus they began to invite ronin across the land in mass to Osaka. These were all forms of masterless samurai who held animosity towards the Tokugawa regime that had displaced them and left them unemployed in an age of peace where they were not needed. However, there were also those who simply came to champion the Toyotomi name once more. In a very short amount of time, Hideyori had amassed a powerful army to defend Osaka against whatever threat may come from Ieyasu, who himself perceived the military buildup as treasonous enough as it is. But this was perhaps all part of his plan. His greatest fears laid in the potential rise of Hideyori, who had the power and name to retake the country from the Tokugawa. Yet now, Ieyasu had caused this potential uprising to fire prematurely, at a time when it could be controlled and dealt with before ever getting too out of hand. Ieyasu could personally see to the destruction of the Toyotomi himself, and die peacefully knowing that its threat no longer loomed over his family's power. He had his justification for war. What he likely didn't anticipate, though, were the powerful names that would still flock to Hideyori's cause. Those who were set to fight bitterly and valiantly against the Tokugawa army. Those who would place fear back into Ieyasu's heart and nearly upend everything he had accomplished. So, what can we learn? By 1611, Tokugawa Ieyasu had thus far managed to curb the power and influence of the young Toyotomi Hideyori. However, during a rare meeting between the two of them in Kyoto that very year, he was caught off guard at how competent the young man appeared, continuing to find ways to thwart any would-be rise Hideyori may attempt. Ieyasu sought to bankrupt him and bring his family firmly under his sphere of influence. He may have even had Kato Kiyomasa, a famous Toyotomi loyalist, killed as precaution. Yet the inevitable would come in 1614, when after the casting of a great bronze bell to mark the finishing of the great Buddha of Kyoto, inscriptions along its side incited the rage of Ieyasu and would lead to the full eruption of hostilities between the two. The final war of the Sengoku period was about to begin. In the next episode, the Winter Siege of Osaka commences, as prominent names flock to join the side of the Toyotomi and halt vicious assaults led by Tokugawa Ieyasu. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.